this computer. Here we go. All righty, so hello Paul Gustard, and uh, nice to see you mate. Thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, say hello to the OG tonight. How's the family doing in the lockdown, all good? All oh, good mate, we're still alive. Um, I reckon the biggest challenge has been trying to coordinate some work, um, coordinate reintegration with wife, and then uh, home education with the kids, you know, our kids are seven, five and two. So that's been a challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a coaching challenge, really, isn't it? You know, the art of teaching and coaching is important. And uh, I've realised I'm not as good as I thought I was, you know, because the kids are basically feral. They're basically feral. <laughs> uh, that's tough, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, we, we, I feel your pain. Yeah, with three kids who are trying to get through that as well. The, um, give us a quick blast, Paul, through your, uh, your rugby journey from, uh, from when you grew up in the North East. Uh, how you got to Leicester um, and, and then London with the Irish and Saris, England and now Quinns. Give us a quick jot through that. Okay. Um, so my, my dad was, uh, you know, I, I suppose a group in Newcastle, which is in the northeast, and, and Newcastle is, is fundamentally a football town. Um, so everyone was kicking the football around for ages. Um, the downside to football, as we know, has got no contact in it. And uh, I've got two left feet. So uh, I probably wasn't, wasn't the best footballer going around. I was energetic and keen, uh, but wanted to try and play rugby. And my dad, um, ironically, was a, was a rugby man. So very few people in our household and our family were all, um, they were all footballers and uh, massive Newcastle United fans. Um, but my dad was a, was a rugby guy. So small you know, tidbit about him. He ended up playing for Spain. Um, he went over there to live for two years and ended up playing for Spain. He played for England B. Uh, which is now England A, which is now England Saxons. And um, he was top try scorer in what is the Premiership now, but the, um, you know, the old uh, National Leagues uh, for two, three years with a team called Gosforth, won, won the John Player Cup a couple of times and was a, was, a, was a pretty formidable winger, as it turned out. So I got into rugby quite early, about seven, eight. Um, you know, really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, loved the camaraderie, loved, loved the mateship, um, loved, loved the, the touring. Uh, loved the fun times with your mates. Uh, loved the bottle of pop and a pack of crisps afterwards on a Sunday. Uh, although you moved on to hot dogs at OGs now, which is a bit flash. Um, and then, um, yeah, I suppose going through school, uh, I started playing at prop. Um, so, you know, when I, when I first played, I probably, I think they stuck me kind of on the wings. My dad was a winger, but I was the biggest kid. So I ended up moving to prop. Uh, and more or less, I played prop all the way through till I was, I was 17. And uh, I was captain of the first team and uh, I played county rugby and so on uh, up, to, up to then. But they made me captain of the first team and uh, we kind of had a discussion around moving to back row that year with the, with the teacher. Uh, but he wanted me to stay a prop because there was loads of back rows and not many people want to play a prop because um, it doesn't make you very handsome. Uh, so I, uh, I said, look, I'll stick it out. And I started playing back row for my club, so, uh, which was Gosford. So at that stage there, really, I was uh, playing regularly for school. Um, I'd, I'd started growing a bit taller. I was, I was probably about six foot three, 100, 100, 100 kilo ish, probably by, by the time I was 17, 18. So I was quite a big lad. And um, you know, really enjoyed my rugby, enjoyed all sports, but, but rugby was the one that I wanted to try and dedicate a bit more time to. So um, I played the year after. I, I left with the, our school, went to the Daily Mail School Cup final, which was the first time and the only time the schools achieved that. And um, on the back of that, I then went to Bladen. Which is which is like a tough kind of uh, area outside of Newcastle, and uh, I kind of went there for a couple of reasons. Really, is the game wasn't professional at that stage, uh, and I wanted to get the kind of um, arrogance or cockiness as a young kid kicked out of me. Um, so I was always the big kid at school, the big kid and in, in represented rugby and so on, and I wanted to play against men. And 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 Bladen kind of had. Uh, Steve Bain, which was a British Lion, uh, that uh, Dave Johnson was ex England A fly off. That loads of guys that had moved from uh, Gosforth uh, into that team. So it, they, were, they were a team that were trying to aspire to get better. Uh, and I went there to play back row. Um, during that year, uh, I played for England Colts and uh, England Universities, British Universities, England University 21s. And the game on the Colts tour, so this is now my end of my year, we, we, um, the game turned professional. And almost it was like the, the, the water turned on at that stage because as soon as the game turned pro, every, every professional club or every club in the premiership or what is now the premiership was ringing me and saying, can you come join us? Can you come, can you come join us? Because they just wanted players. No one really knew what was going on. It was, 
it was uh, it was pissing in the wind a little bit, really. You know, no, it was it was no one really knew what professional rugby was meant to look like. So they just tried to sign anyone that was a junior international uh, and get them in. Anyway, I decided to stay at Bladen. I was doing law at university. Uh, so I went through the period. I, I, I captained England 21s. I played for England students for a couple of years. I uh, captained British universities. Played for the North of England uh, men's team. I uh, got my county cap, full county cap for Durham. Uh, started regularly for Bladen. Was at university. Having a whale of a time. Was captain of the university team. Um, you know, and everything was good. Everything was good. And I, but I, I always wanted to, to give it a crack. You know, I suppose one thing as a little boy, I always wanted to play for England. And, um, you know, at 35, 36, I could be whatever I wanted to be in life, be a, um, a painter, be a carpenter, be a lawyer, be a doctor, whatever. But I couldn't play for England probably at 35 to 45 and have a professional career. So I decided at the end of my third year at university uh, to take one of the professional opportunities up, which was at Leicester. And, um, you know, Bob Dwyer rang me up and he tried to get me to play in a, in a sevens competition uh, prior to joining, to, to what, what decided for him to go for them. But I'd, uh, I rolled my ankle. Uh, um, on the on the drink somewhere at university, and uh, <laughs> I was I was so desperate to play. I was so desperate to play, but I went down. My, my ankle was like a balloon, and um, I was trying to get my foot in a boot and all sorts. But uh, it didn't, didn't didn't quite work out in the in the summer. But I went there, um, trained really hard in the first kind of month or two, and um, as was the story of my kind of career. Really, I, I broke down with injury and missed about a month and a half um, in the kind of preseason. Um, but still made my debut, I think it was in October, against, uh, against Toulouse in, in the, what is now the Heineken Cup, uh, which was awesome. Um, you know, played pretty well. Then made my full debut the week after against Sale. Uh, we had a 50-point victory uh, at home. Uh, scored a try, um, which, which was great in front of Welford Road, 16,000 people. A really cool experience. Played alongside, uh, you know, Martin Johnson, Neil Back. Uh, Will Greenwood, Pat Howard, uh, Vasari Sarevi, Darren Garforth, Richard Cockrell, Graham Roundtree, uh, Matt Poole, Fritz Van Heden, uh, Martin Corey, Austin Healy, uh, Adele Carduni. I'd actually fortunately left. Uh, just left a lot of his body hair in the plug hole. And uh, <laughs> that was it. So look, it was, um, it, it was unbelievable. And then in, then in the summer, I, I broke down with injury again at Christmas time. And I ended up getting a groin operation. And... Um, Kind of, so I'd started most of the games up till around January, February time. Went down for this operation, and when I came back, I was on the bench pretty much every 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 game through to the end of the season. Uh, Bob Dwyer left that year, and uh, Dean Richards took over, and then we had you know three years of really of, of high success. I was invited to go touring with England to um, the Tour of Doom, which is now known as to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, for, you know, I'm not sure. Fortunately or unfortunately, I missed it, <laughs> but. Um, um, you know, it gave me more resolve to try and make sure I got fit for, for the next year again, start like a house on fire. I got invited to the um, England squad to train with the World Cup. So that was the 99 World Cup squads. Uh, we got down to 37 people and then they got cut from 37 to 30 and I was one of the seven that got cut. Um, but again, you know, we were, you know, I was close. I was close and, um, you know, re really, I played some really good rugby that started that year. Uh, then I got injured again. Um, around November, December, was out for two months, got back, played for England A <clears throat> in the Six Nations. And then uh, I played in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong for, for England Sevens, which was really cool. And then for the next two, three years, that was kind of the story of my career. I kept playing really well, getting involved in England camps, uh, and then breaking down with injury, uh, which, which kind of at the time, I always felt, you know, oh, what, why me? What have I done? Why am I unlucky? Or why is he getting picked out of me? And, and kind of in hindsight now, I didn't do enough of the small things I needed to do. Uh, which I might elaborate on later on, but but kind of on reflection, you know, it's, it's it's more about what I didn't do as much as anything else, you know, and control of things I could control better, and I've been a better headspace and been a better athlete for it. But um, at the time, wasn't quite there. So at, at 25, uh, I, I, I tore my ankle ligaments. Uh, 24 down in Bristol, and I got back. And for the first time, when I got back fit, uh, I didn't get selected in a in a match day squad. So I, I threw my toys out the pram and said I want to leave. And uh, Dean wouldn't let me. And uh, for about six weeks, I kept knocking on his door when I was on the bench or, or not playing. I said, "Look, man, I need to play. I've been in the England squads. I want to get back back in there." And eventually, around January, February time, he let me go, and I joined London Irish. Played England A. Uh, played for England in the summer against the Barbarians. Uh, missed out on the tour. I broke my foot. I uh, missed out on the tour to Argentina, unfortunately. And um, that was my last involvement with England at 25, 26. Uh, 
Stoke Irish, you know, really good, fun club. Um, played some really good rugby. Um, learned a lot of things. Got coached really well. Um, but uh, the team struggled. He was, yeah. That's where I first met Brendan. Uh, he made me captain, which, which, which was great. Um, but with the team struggled. We just couldn't score points. We couldn't score enough points. And we always relied on our defence, which was great. But uh, we couldn't score enough points. Ultimately, the game of rugby scored one point more than the opposition. And uh, we weren't doing that enough. You know, we were losing 17 15, 16 12, 21 13, that kind of thing. We never got put away, but we just couldn't, just couldn't score enough points. Um, so that was, a, that was a really good three, four years. And then around 30, they, they offered me an extension. I just thought, look, let's give it one more go, try and go to a club that maybe had a bit more, a bit more about them, a bit more resource. And uh, I joined Saracens for two years. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, uh, Eddie was working as a consultant, Eddie Jones working as a consultant. Uh, so I went and met Eddie. Uh, I actually had a broken arm at the time. And um, so that's kind of a story. Every year I kind of got one injury that put me out for three months. But I uh, met Eddie and uh, he signed me, which was great. Uh, had two years playing there, really, you know, re- really enjoyed it. You know, again, well coached, good environment, good players. You know, what was now turned out to be an unbelievable. Um, into coaching. So kind of, that was my kind of playing career, if you like. A bit long-winded, maybe, but uh, I'm talking about myself, so I'm allowed to. Um, but look, I really enjoyed it. I played about 250 first-class games. Uh, played a couple of times for England non-cap games. Played for England about 10 times. Played for England sevens, captain in 21s. Uh, played in Colts, England students, um, and so on. So I, I, did, I did all right. You know, won, won, won a few premierships. Uh, won two Anakin Cups. Uh, won a, whatever the version of the John Players Cup is, Pilkington Cup, whatever it's called. Um, so in that regard, was really successful. And then, then I was very fortunate, really, that um, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. Eddie then came back to, to Saracens. He wasn't actually coaching at the time. He was coaching in Japan at Suntory. And he came back in, and he either recruited me as a coach or he retired me as a player. And, and kind of knowing Eddie now, he definitely retired me as a player. <laughs> That's kind of, kind of what I learned about him. And um, he, he made me a skills coach, and it was it – was, it was tough work, to be honest. Um, you know, I was working six and a half days a week, pretty full on, you know, early starts, late finishes. I was also trying to run a marathon. So I was running to work all the time. And um, it was like long days. It was just about to get married uh, to, to my first wife. Um, bitch. And, uh, and um, I was kind of going through that. And um, look, it was... It was, it was Great, great learning to sort, you know, code pedagogy, uh, period. Also, you know, there's, an, there's an art of coaching, there's an art of teaching. And Eddie was a former teacher. And um, the detail and, and depth of some of the conversations he would have was outstanding. So real good learning, uh, learning curve for me my first year. He then left. He, he, got, uh, he got the elbow around January, February. And uh, Brendan Bent was appointed for the summer. Uh, obviously, I knew Brendan. I, I'd played with him at Irish. And uh, he ran me up and asked me to be the defence coach and the forwards coach. And, um, you know, at the time it was, it was obviously two big jobs, you know, normally it goes to two different people. And um, I was kind of keen to try and make sure Alex uh, Sanderson was, was already at the club as well. So look, can we share the responsibility for the forward stuff? And he's like, yes, of course you can. Um, so me and Al split the, the, the scrum and the line out rolls up. Uh, Kobus Fasahi was there as well, who was coaching the scrum. And then I t- took the defence really. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a, a really good time to be at the club. Um, you know, fantastic club. Uh, brilliant, brilliant chairman, brilliant at board level. Uh, you know, Brendan is a, is a fantastic human being. Uh, Edward Griffiths, who came in, you know, really motivated, very good with the, very good with the players. And then the coaching group that, you know, just happened to get assembled at the right time, right place. Uh, great people, first and foremost. Uh, bright people, so they're intelligent, they can think, they've got growing mindset. And, um, you know, it was the start of, a, start of an incredible journey for a long period of time. You know, obviously still now they're still, whatever said, they're still the best team in Europe, uh, in my mind. And, um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a lot of sadness around what's happened. Um, but, but, you know, for, for the six, seven years or eight years I coached there, you know, the, the tiles that we won, the memories that we made, the experience that we had uh, was just incredible. So to, to be part of that, to be part of the club, um, to, to, to lay a bedrock really for, for the dominance that Saracens now have, which, which I did, you know, which I did alongside the other coaches. You know, the, the club's based on outstanding defence, and you know, I, I kind of put that in there for eight years. In a strong set piece, I did the line outs, attack, and defence for a long period of time for eight years. 
and um, you know contribute in other ways to the club as well. So I've got so much to be thankful for for, for Saracens for uh, not just the memories and, and the experiences that I had and that you know memories on the field and off the field as a player and as a coach uh, it is also the opportunities I now have on the back of the success that Saracens are, that had. You know the team that, that that was there, the coach that were there allowed me to get the opportunity to go and coach with England and then uh, obviously lastly with, uh, with with Quinn. So um, on to England I guess. <clears throat> Uh, Eddie rang me up. Um, I bumped into him actually. We beat Newcastle away with, with Saracens, and uh, he was watching the game. He'd just been appointed, and we saw him at the airport. Heathrow, and he's not particularly a tactile kind of person, Eddie. Uh, but I gave him a hug, and, and I hadn't seen him for ages. And Alex gave him a hug. We both, you know, started coaching journeys with with Eddie, and uh, he said, "Look, he just whispered in my ear, look, I'll be in touch." And then the Wednesday, he rang me. And uh, I spoke to Mark on the Monday, and I think there's some rumours going around that maybe maybe they're going to come come after me. And he ran me on the Wednesday. I said, "Look, you know, we had a bit of a catch up and a, and a chat." And I said, "Look, you know, I've missed his call a couple of times. I'm sorry, mate. You know, my, my little boy Rafi, um, who you obviously know, uh, Rafi had been about 18 months at the time, and he was needing his nappy changes or something." And um, I said, "Look, mate, sorry, mate. My my little boy needs me." And he goes, "Well, now your country needs you, son. We need you now." Which was quite a nice line. And um, I said, right, okay. So, well, look, I'm under contract. I'm really happy. You know, I really, really, um, really privileged for you to ask me. But I, you know, I think I'm on the set. Saracens, like we're on, we're on the staffs and special. We never defended better that year. You know, we, we conceded I think six tries in twelve games. Isn't it? We were on fire. Line that was working was smashing everybody. And it was, um, you know, we knew we were on the staffs and really special. Um, but he said, look, two days to think about. It. Come back to me by Friday five o'clock. Let me know. And that was it. So then for like two days, we bounced it around. And for most people, obviously, the opportunity to coach England is huge. Um, but, but, I, but obviously, I knew what I was leaving behind at Saracens, which, which people on the outside don't see. And um, it was really, it, was, it was took till five to five to make a decision. Uh, as it happened, we were on a staff uh, Christmas social. And uh, I was in tears. I was all over the place with Mark and Phil Morrow. And said, so, look, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. And the, the kind of long and short came down to it is I, I was so close as a player. You know, I would never have been a 50 cap player, but you know, to have had seven or eight caps, I was as good as anybody else. I played seven or eight caps worth of rugby, and um, I kind of felt like if my little boy, uh, so Rafi or any of the kids, in 20 years' time, I'm going to be with their mate watching the World Cup. And it's like your dad used to coach rugby, didn't he? Yeah, who did he coach? Oh, Saracens, Harlequins, Worcester, you know, I don't know, Rouen and Francis. I oh, never coach England. Oh, no, you got asked once. Oh, okay, you know, and I kind, I kind of want to. I kind of wanted to have something where you could say, yeah, my dad coached England. So that was kind of one of the things. And um, I think the other thing my dad said about 10 to 5 on, on that Friday was, you know, regret the things you do do in life rather than the ones you don't. Um, so I had the courage, courage to make a decision. And uh, that's what I did. So I did that, you know, really successful. You know, we, went, we equaled the world record for, for number of wins. Uh, we, we conceded four tries in the first six nations. Uh, took, you know, the second longest period before we conceded the first try. Um, you know, Grand Slam was the first time since 2003, back to back Six Nations, Australia two win. Um, you know, it was just an incredible, incredible ride. Unfortunately, the wheels fell off a little bit the last year I was involved. Uh, the boys were tired, a few injuries, and um, we, we, we probably pushed them a little bit too far in one direction and uh, probably could have coached better and all the rest of it. And then we had some, some family situation outside of my family unit, if you like, which kind of, kind of meant that I couldn't commit mentally and emotionally what I needed to commit to England being away from home so much and the opportunity to become head coach of Harkins came up and um, the team was struggling they were they were finished 11th uh, the year before I joined we finished fifth last year uh, or joined fourth uh, got to the semi-final challenge cup um, you know they had the worst defensive record uh, the year before I joined they had the joint fourth or fourth uh, last year uh, and this year we've been a bit yo yeah, we've been crippled with injuries and uh, it's been frustrating, but we made our first final in five seasons in the, in the Prem Cup. Um, so, you know, we're, we're one trajectory one gone up. We've made two or three big signings and uh, that's kind of our journey, I guess. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, that's brilliant. And it's great to see, uh, you know, that amount of success that's, 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 that's sort of followed you through it. So, you know, you've obviously, mm-hmm. you're obviously doing something right. Um, let, let's talk about Harlequins a bit. Uh, you know, you, you're there at the moment. I mean, Obviously, 2020 is an absolute nightmare with uh, COVID, the situation that we're all in at the moment. How, how are you managing the squad at the moment and the players' fitness? I mean, they've talked to, uh, I know we can't talk about um, you know, when we're going to get back, uh, but how are you just keeping an eye on the players at the moment and, and what they're doing? 
As opposed to sitting down eating chicken all day or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going, going to loot and eating chicken. Uh, look, I think, I think it was a, I think it was a, there's a couple of things really. The, the, the first thing I think was to be you know, cognizant or be aware of the situation that we all entered into. So, you know, every, everyone is now in a situation that's so unparalleled and so unprecedented. There was no formula, there's no manuscript, there's no book. So the first thing was to say, right, what, 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 what am I experiencing? What, what, are, what is the, the rest of the staff experiencing? And that was shock a little bit, um, you know, lack of clarity or lack of understanding about actually this pandemic. What, what does it mean? What's the implications? Um, then the next thing is like reintegration back into normal time at home, family life with your kids where you can't go to a gym, you can't go somewhere else. So we wanted to give the players, you know, three weeks or so of space, just mental space. Don't think about rugby. So we kind of backed off them. So we communicate that to them and say, look, guys, you know, obviously we're going to back off and we want your bodies to take over. The government is saying, obviously, one of the best things you can do is keep your immunity up high is to make sure that you continue to keep physical exercise. So it wasn't that we were asking anything that was different to Public Health England. Um, we gave them some, some base level kind of stuff that you would normally do when a season ends, uh, just to keep your body ticking over before the intensity ramps up again. Um, obviously, as, as time's gone on, um, one, one of the hardest things has been is, is the lack of clarity about when we could start and not start. So rugby was one of the few sports really that didn't go flag in the sand, we're done. We're going to wait till next year. We're still saying, look, we're going to try and play, which is still the aim. And it looks like obviously now, the, oh, you, you read the press, of course, over the last kind of two weeks or so, we're definitely in trajectory now where we're likely to get back in sooner rather than later. And uh, the aim is to finish this season before we start next season. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, long the, the long-term strategy. So the first few weeks was a bit of find yourself, get some form. We then started doing things like this, Zoom meetings, Microsoft Teams meetings, um, uh, giving Robbie information. We did a reflection piece on getting some, some feedback on our performance, why we were so inconsistent, um, what can we do, who's responsible, what's your accountability in that from the players. Um, is that what's our coaching like in those areas? Is, it, is the messaging clear? Um, are our principles good? Are our principles right? Do you understand our principles? So, so all, all that kind of thing. We did a big kind of survey piece. We then divide them up into different groups and try and get a little bit more information on uh, to some wider aspects. And then they're doing things like this on, online with coaches and uh, also also with physios. You know, we've got guys coming back from long term injuries that are having to do rehab. Uh, via FaceTime or via, via Zoom where they're trying to show something and try something. We're now trying to get players ready for uh, preparation again to try and get back to training. So, you know, imagine things like props and stuff like that, you know, the amount of load that's going to get through their, their, their spine. You know, we're going to have to do some isometric holds at home against walls and, um, you know, it's hard to push against your missus if you're Joe Marley, you know, so you have to put against a brick wall uh, and just hold that position for 30 seconds, that kind of stuff, you know, put a pillow against the wall and, and scrum. Um, we gave all the players some gym equipment, you know, therabands, banded work, uh, barbells, dumbbells, um, you know, prioritize those that need to lift. Uh, so, so our forwards, but they don't have enough volume of weight. And, you know, a lot of guys in London, obviously, are, are living in, you know, flats and, and small places where they don't have outdoor spaces, they don't have gyms, they don't have a garage. So, you know, they've got a barbell in the living room, basically, and they don't all have benches. They've got a table on the floor. Um, so it's, it's more like high repetition work they've been doing in the gym. Um, and then the fitness stuff on fields and stuff, they just get given programs or suggested programs to do. Um, one, of the, one of the bigger issues we have is the, the potential atrophy uh, for players uh, moving forward. So I've just got a little vis visitor here. Do you want to say hello, Andy? Which one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is real, eh? This is real time. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, one, one of the things we're concerned about is the atrophy for, uh, and uh, muscle wastage. So... You know, that's, that's a big thing that we're trying to prepare ourselves for when we get back in. Yeah. Uh, and, and things like your Achilles um, and, and some of your, your uh, neural pathways to make sure they're getting fired up now before they go back into training. So we don't pull a hamstring early. We don't, we don't snap an Achilles um, because those things, you know, four, six weeks, you know, really, 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 really hurt us. So um, all that kind of sets a lot of consideration. And um, as, as a bigger piece, I guess we, we identified three areas, three buckets, if you like, about what we want to try and get right. So the first thing was, Tactical development, how do we improve our game? How do we improve our, our coaching process? Um, you know, in terms of attack, defense, set piece, and so on. Then we have personal development. Every single uh, staff member has got a personal development plan. Three things that are important to, to them. Three things that we feel is a, is a priority to help the club move forward. 
Um, they had to identify the resources and activities they had to do. And then the final thing was communication skills. One to the, uh, the players, uh, and then the second thing, intra and inter-department as well. So those are the three broad buckets. Um, we've gone heavy onto our PD, uh, heavy onto personal development. Uh, uh, we've we redone a, an entire playbook for the players. And um, that's it, really. So like, we, 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 tried to, we tried to amalgamate it with, obviously, people have got kids to make sure that we weren't um, totally intrusive into, into a new lifestyle. So we try and do like a, a block in the morning and then leave, leave the rest of the day to themselves. But each department had a choice about, you know, for, for them to organize in their groups of six or seven about what they do. Then the team-wise, we broke up into like front row, uh, second rows, back row, nines, tens, centers, back three. So again, it was a bit easy to manage smaller numbers for co for conversations anyway. Yeah. It's a better way to try and get more information and check understanding, but also easier to, 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 to coordinate four or five diaries than, than, um, than 45. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of work, isn't it? But clearly you put a load into it. Um, and how far down do you go with that? I mean, do you go into, is that just with the first team squad or do you drop down into the academy players as well? Or? <laughs> Well, mate, the, 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 don't DM. Yeah, the, the issue's going to be. Uh, um, look, the, the academy stuff. We 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 have a handle on it in terms of there's a coaching direction. There's a coaching direction, but fundamentally, the, the academy always train. You always train with the first team, but we're going to change that slightly because we're going to go so fast potentially from you know zero to to performance that we want to make sure that the energy and amount of repetition um, goes heavily to the players that are going to play. So the, the, the focus is going into those guys there. But in terms of the academy boys, um, the first year academy, so the guys that are coming in are, are coming from school. So they've not got exams at the moment, so they can join us as normal. The, the, the year that I've already done one year apprenticeship, if you like, and the second year, they always train with us. They've got personal development plans. Um, they get all the same kind of coaching uh, access that, that, that the senior players do. All the um, athletic performance stuff that everyone else does as well. So we, we want to treat everyone the same. You know, every, well, treat everyone the same but different is our expression. So yeah. everyone gets the same opportunity and access to everything, but you've got to respect the individuals and everyone's different. And then your way of communication and what they require will therefore be different. And what, um, so keeping on the academy players then, so what, what do you look for um, from them? So if they're all training with your first team along with you, what do you look for them in terms of their ability or attitude and, and how much do you look at things like, you know, how hard they're working at school or at university or what have you? Yeah, so look, I, I suppose the, the, the second thing is the thing I'll start with first. So in terms of school, uh, you know, it depends, it depends how deep down the pathway you go for me. I, I don't go beyond the, the first year that I'm going to come into the senior program because uh, the pathway, it just I haven't got enough time to go under 17s down. So I, I get I get feedback on who the kids coming through. So when we do a depth chart from the first team through the club, I get picked off that it, you know we've got a couple of under 16 year olds that are meant to be you know like gun players. So we're trying to see in our depth chart moving up at some stage who's going to drop off the top end. Can the 16 year old when he's 19 take his place basically? So. We, we've, we've got that. But other than that, it's only the guys about to come in, how they're doing, how can we assist them, what other, what other um, benefit can they have of being a Harlequin. So if there's anything else that we can do in terms of making their last year at school easier, in terms of helping them uh, juggle a, a, a rugby conditioning um, element through their, through their A-levels before they come back into, into Harlequins in effectively normally mid-June so they're literally finishing the exam a week later they're into into training you know or beginning of July so that side of things in terms of school and education if you now come to the club it's kind of driven that we want everyone to either do uh, a secondary education so be it college um, or, or a diploma or something else where you can try and be a more rounded human being um, university um, if you're a little bit older and maybe you've done a degree or you've done a postgrad of some sort, you might want to do uh, networking opportunities or try and see if we can pay for, for a job, something else, so learning a vocation. So there's always an encouragement to make sure that that side of, of rugby is taken care of. Like if we see the situation we're in now, you know, worst case scenario is rugby goes bust and, and there's no rugby. You know, we all lose a job and it'd be the same for the player. So, so to be aware about what other skills have you got to prepare yourself, it's a great wake up call for everybody. And um, we, we believe firmly, and, and I'll take this from Saracens, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's all our thinking, but the idea that, you know, better people 
will make better rugby players. So, you know, to be a better person, be more rounded, education is a vital part of, of being a good person because you can make good rational choices, um, you know, right from wrong. Uh, you treat people with respect. Uh, and and I, I think it's just, it's important that we continue to progress these kids through that. Um, and the first question was what? Linked to that, think, what do you say? To I think I think you've answered really. I was asking I was asking about um, you know the uh, the academy kids and uh, um, you know what 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 you look for for them in oh, yeah. terms of ability and attitude. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that, that, on the field, mate, the first thing we look for is competitive spirit. That's the first thing I look for. Can can this kid fight? And, and I, I don't mean punch and fight. I mean can he fight for something? So if you if you've got competitive desire, that can mask a lot of things. You can mask a lot of things. I'd rather take the kid who's got you know someone about him, he's got a personality on the field, than than somebody that's you know you know 15, 16, beats people for fun, beats people for fun, but when it comes to contact, doesn't want to know. Or someone that's just a just a heavy GT runs through people, but but doesn't have skill. But if they've got something where you can see that there's something about the game that they are they are linked into and love so i'll do it a different way the things i look for when i recruit people first thing is to not be a dickhead the first thing like to meet the person always is this a good person is this somebody that we can coach so because if, if you're that then you, you've got coachability second thing i want to see people that have got ambition because if they've got, if they've got ambition it means they're going to listen to what we're going to try and say because they want to get better so again it, it gives coachability um the next thing is like work ethic my work ethic, you're going to have to be able to work hard because, you know, rugby's not for everybody. There's only, you know, even now, um, there's probably what, there's there's 12 premiership clubs as we stand. Um, say each one, let's just say 60 players a team. So that's seven and 20 jobs, seven and 20 jobs. And let's say there's five teams that pay in the, in the, in the league below uh, to, to, to someone where you can actually live and support a mortgage of some sort. Um, and let's say there's another thousand players around the world, or 3,000 players that are English around the world. That's less than 5,000 jobs for an English kid. You know, 5,000 jobs to be a player. So it's, it's not for everyone because it's going to be tough. There's going to be times where it's really tough and you've got, you've got to want to stick out, you want to work, and, and that's why the next bit's important. You've got to have a passion for the game. Because if you don't like rugby, like really, really like rugby, then it's hard to do some of the things that are asked of you. It's hard to go when it's cold and your fingers are, fingers are frozen and, and you've got Darren Garforth um, scabs coming off your psoriasis on the back of your neck and uh, you're getting bitten by Richard Cockrell. You know, you've got to want to be there to do something. And it, it's kind of like, if you've got all those things, then the final thing is what's your talent like? You know, because it's all very well being tough and resilient and, and passionate and, and a good bloke. You've got to be able to play the game a bit as well, you know, but, but I'd take those other things before I take before, before I look at the talent. Cool. Um, and where are you getting the kids from at the moment? On the whole, I mean, you, you, do you think the private school education, or is it a whole? Are you just looking at local rugby clubs. Where do you go? Where do you go looking for your talent? Yeah, look, it's it's mixed, really, Rich. I, I suppose you know the way the way the, the pathway system works is that every team has the Buffalo again. Every, the way that every team the way that every team works is you got designated space, you know. And so where we are, we, we have the second largest catchment area in the country. Um, you know, we've got a lot of big private schools that are down there, but also, you know, we're, we're, we're on the next to one of the biggest cities in the world. You know, we, we're the closest London team, really. You know, we, we are Twickenham them as, as close than anybody else to think central London until maybe Irish moved to Brentford. You know, like that, that, that's basically where we are. Um, and then there's so many kids that are, you know, got you know genetic advantages to, to some of the kids down from Leafy Surrey, you know. Um, and they've got a different story. They've got a different story. They've got a different background. They've got a different hunger. They've got a different reason to play the game. And, and would, would be foolish uh, to, to, to miss out on some of those kids. You know, we have, you know, you, you see some of the likes of, um, I don't know, Carl Sinclair, you know, came through, came through uh, Batsy Ironside. You know, you've got guys, Nessa didn't follow that way, but, but, Ethnicity is going to play a big part, I think, in rugby moving forward. You see the influence now of Pacific Islands. Uh, you, you see the influence of, of African players. Um, and it's huge. You know, look at someone like Maro. You know, Maro, like he is an incredible athlete. Incredible athlete. He can do things um, that, that some kids just can't do. And it's partly due to his, um, his genetics. And it's massively due to his desire. And his drive and his dedication to what he does. 
Um, but, but there's definitely something there around where the game's going to the game's gonna look a bit different type of athlete because the game line's so important. And uh, people like control that game line through um, a physical presence, um, you know, being moved around by guys that can pass, of course. But, you know, you need, you need probably 10, 11 guys that can control the game line and attack and defence. And, um, you know, Africans and, and uh, Pacific Islanders can do that. So, you, so you've got all this foreign influence and then you've got two northern lads from Newcastle and Wigan who are, who are running the show down in the posh West London club that's Harlequins. I mean, how do you two boys go down with the, uh, with the rather upper-class uh, Chino-wearing uh, brigade down there? I don't know why you keep thinking we're Chino-wearing, mate. Look, I think, I think the first thing, like, opposites attract, right? You've got a beautiful wife and look at you. Um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like... It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, one, the one thing is, I think when you come into a position um, of, of where you're coaching, the first thing that's important that you know your onions, right? You, you, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to be able to stand up there and, and people have got to be able to respect you and you've got to be able to talk some sense and you've got to be clear with what you're saying because if not, you get found out quite quick. Um, so go, going into that, you know, if we take, you know, my, my coaching background would suggest that I've, I've been successful. Um, you know, I worked with a lot of those guys initially, the first, first year, last year especially, you know, the likes of uh, Marla, Sinclair, uh, Rob Shaw, Clifford, Kerr, Brown, uh, Marcus, uh, Marchant, uh, kind of the boys I did in the day with Will Colley actually got cap- captain of the two of us as well. So there's quite, there's quite a few around there that I knew. Um, so they've seen me coached, I've been coached by them. So, you know, give, give me a bit of a head start. Sean Long was one of the most gifted you know, plays of his generation. Um, you know, a fantastic, fantastic rugby league player. So he comes in with 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 some credit. You know, because of some credit, he's coached for ten years now, uh, albeit a different code. But but some of the messaging that he has, he says things in a different way. He say, says things very simple because he is. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a real there's a real purpose to what he says and a real purpose about what he wants. And um, to, to you know, the, the brutal truth is, I'm not using him well enough this year. And um, that's one of our, one of my failings, one of, you know, the, the coaching group's failings really is that, you know, by bringing somebody in from the outside, you want to try and challenge your river of thinking, if you like. And he came in and, and look, he, he, got, he got some things wrong for sure, but we, we should, have, should have expected that a, a bit more and allowed that a bit more. Uh, so when the good stuff came in, it was almost like packing stuff away too fast. And uh, this year we've kind of changed it. You know, there's been a really good two months to try and reflect on some of, some of my mistakes and my failings and uh, make sure that Sean's got more of a presence next year. Uh, so he'll take over our set piece attack and uh, still has a lot of detail around the running lines and stuff. We really need to focus hard on one facet of the game there. So, look, I, I think he's, he's, he's got something different to what other guys have got. Uh, a lot of bodying for one. Uh, but he's also got like a, a different way of looking at the game, which is great. Uh, we've got Nick Evans, a former All Black, 16 yeah. Cats All Black, you know, one of the Premiership all time uh, greatest players. Then Adam Jones, um, you know, as a scrum coach, um, you know, again, somebody else from the wrong part of the world. And um, he's, uh, you know, he's fantastic. You know, he's got, he's got some stories, Adam. And, um, you know, he's, he's played almost 100 games for England. Uh, England, Christ, wouldn't have got 100 games for England. He might have got 20. Got 100 games to Wales. And a uh, couple of British Lions too, as the course, cut the Grand Slams, and he's happy to tell you about them all. So, look, it's a, it's a good coaching group, and it's a young coaching group. Uh, I'm the most experienced coach there, and it's, it's my job to try and see how I can not only coach the team and, and, and direct the club in a direction of, of high performance, he's also trying to see how I can develop these young coaches who've got a lot of talent, a lot of individual skill, um, a lot of excitement, a lot of passion for the game, I'm trying to make sure I foster that well as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I like that, Sean. When uh, I met him with you, he was funny. He was, uh, like you say, he just tells it straight as it is. He said, I'm the best fly up. I was like, what are you going to bring to Rugby Union? He's like, I'm the best fly up in the country at the moment. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just see things that no one else can see. So it must be really interesting to work with someone like that. He was, he, yeah, he was five points deep at the time, mate. His vision was definitely <laughs> clear at that stage. I still remember it, yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's go, we've got a couple of questions from the from the kids that they've uh, they've asked for you. Uh, uh, John and Max Dingle from the under 15s asked, um, but yeah, they put the question in two ways actually. So they've said, why are England unable to sustain success over a long period of time? And just to qualify that, you know, to compare it, except for example, to the All Blacks who are able to sustain such high levels of performance over over decades. 
Look, I think it, it, it's, it's a great question, actually, um, because on the face of it, we, we've got the wealthiest union. Uh, we have the largest player, uh, player pool. Um, so if you, if you look at resource, then resource-wise, we have um, supply. You know, we, have, we have a lot of players, so we've got a lot of players to choose from. A lot of players, therefore, hopefully drive competition to get towards the top. Um, and then we've got funding, um, which is massive, and there are a few at grassroots level to get more kids playing, to get more um, you know, community coaching and so on, developing through. So on the face of it, we should. The, the, the two reasons, I think, if I reflect on that a little bit, is the first thing is it, it's not our national game. You know, it's not our national game. And whatever we do, and for all those people that love rugby and play rugby, there's just not as much drive around the country as, it, as there is in New Zealand. You know, New Zealand almost going to recession when they don't win the World Cup. It's, it's, they get uh, pulled from pillar to post publicly if they don't perform. So they are the premier athletes in, in New Zealand are the All Blacks. And from a kid, from a young age upwards, everything about us being about being an All Black. Everything is driven about being an All Black. So the whole pathway is geared towards playing rugby for New Zealand. Second to that, as much as we talk about supply, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing, is we have 12 teams. So whilst there's a few jobs, whilst there's a few jobs, like we said, it, it's um, you know, 50, 50, 55 per team, um, the All Blacks have four teams. You know, and it, it, there's, there's less there. So again, the competition is so fierce to get them. And, and they've, they've developed a culture of excellence that England have yet to do. Now, I think over the last kind of four years with, with Eddie, I, I definitely think we've seen more, more drive in that direction or, or, or more, more direction in that, I should say. And also, I think what he's, what he's trying to instill with the players is, you know, it's not okay to come second. You know, it's not okay to come second. You know, we, we don't want to be in it. It's a bit of an English mentality, really. You know, we, we celebrate losses sometimes. You know, when, you know if, if, I, if I think back to a kid and watching, you know, um, Gaza, uh, mm. you know, in, in 94 or whatever. In, uh, was it 94? Was it, was 96. It? 96, sorry, you know. And um, no, I watched about that. They came back, they were like heroes. And, you know, they made us proud. They made us proud. New Zealand, they lose. No one wants to know them. No one wants to know them. So we, we do accept, as a country, we do accept people or, or teams when they fail. You know, we do accept them. And it's that kind of plucky English spirit. We tried hard. We gave it all. And yes, we did. And yes, every team does. But ultimately, to what end? And, and I remember, I was chatting to Nick Evans about this the other day as it happened. And he said, so Nick Evans is our, is our former old black fly half. And he said, as a kid, when he was growing up, he used to have above his um, old dial-up phone. Kids on here won't know what those are, but the old dial-up phones. And he used to, there was a sign that his dad on the wall with a, with a uh, uh, the fern, the fern, and it just said, "No one remembers who came second. <laughs> and that was it. He said, "So it wasn't that it was just you know spoken to him about. It was always just around him. Like there was no, there was no one happy to people finish second. So I think those are two of the biggest drivers why. That said, I think over the last four or five years we've been successful for a period of time. Um, you know, have won Six Nations, have won a Grand Slam, um, have won the first ever series in Australia, have uh, won the tour in Argentina and so on. So there has been some, some, some you know, have now beaten the All Blacks once. So it's now the, the next step. Like, how do they continue that? And, and like, 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 let's not forget, the All Blacks lost three World Cups before they won their, their next three. You know, so, so maybe, maybe England's, maybe the next one with, with Atoje at 29, you know, Farrell at 32 and so on with 150 caps and, and told you 80, 90 caps. Maybe maybe that's the best chance we're ever going to have, you know, of, of, of winning the next World Cup. Yeah, well, well let, let's hope so. Um, Louis in our under 10s uh, sent in a couple of uh, questions for you. So, Louis, why don't you uh, ask your questions to Paul? So, my question is, when the wolf pack started, is it true that you bought real wolves to the training ground and who was the most scared? <laughs> Great question, mate. Um, so, yes, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, I did bring him in. It wasn't the first time when I, when I introduced it. Well, what actually happened really was I was talking about defence. I was talking about uh, bringing passion and, and hunting as a pack. And kind of as I was talking about, so it was like hunting the pack like a pack of wolves. It kind of almost just came out... You know, I hadn't planned that it just came out like that. And, and there was a player at uh, South at the time called Andy Saul. Uh, he was a young seven. And he let out a wolf cry. And then a few of the other boys let out a wolf cry. So after that, I got some T-shirts knocked up the next week saying raised by wolves. 
and that that was the start of it. So then everything I did around defense was with the wolf head, with the wolf head. So about year two, year three, as it happened, ironically, we were playing Harlequins, and uh, Harlequins were going pretty well at the time, uh, which is unusual, except for that. <laughs> and um, we were we were we were talking about them about what it takes, what it means to be a Harlequin, and then what it means to be a Saracen. And uh, as, as I kind of said, what it means to be a Saracen, we spoke about um, the canthropy, which is the ability to harness the power of a wolf, right? And um, I then stopped and said, look, things about get a bit weird in here now, guys. And through the back of Allianz Park, through the players' lounge, this, this handler came in with these two wolves. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a wolf, but they're a lot bigger than they actually look <laughs> on TV. <laughs> and they came in, and, and although these, are, these were two wolves that... Um, are, I suppose, used for TV stuff. So they, they're used on TV, so they've been relatively trained, not tamed, but relatively trained. So they've got two handlers. I stood, uh, Louis, about four or five meters in front of them, and the smell of them smelled fearsome. <laughs> like there was, a, there was a, an aura around them. And I know that people were getting scared because the entire front row of, of the meeting all shifted back as soon as they walked into it. So... There was a few boys in the front row, and you know, for anyone that says Brad Barrett's as hard as nails, mate, you want to ask them how far these, how far back these boys moved, because it was a genuine. And, and I, like I was talking, and I, I can't see that these things are also moving around behind me. So um, I think I think we all had a bit of fear in our mouth. But then, then after it, they took them down to the changing room, and the players had photos with them. But the players had to go in first and sit down in the changing room. The wolves then go in the, uh, and they walk around. They walk around to get a, a scent and the smell of the, of the, of the uh, environment that they're in. And then they sat down and had a photo with them. And Edward, our CEO, had an idea that he said, look, let's all run out with the wolves. And the wolves go out the tunnel first and then the players come out afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the handlers for the wolves are like, that's, that's not going to work out well for anybody. So we didn't get, we didn't get that shot. But if you look online... Uh, you, you'll see a few pictures with Pete and Jack Berger and people like that sitting in the changing room with these two walls in the, in the floor in the changing room, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Brilliant. Good, good question, Louis. The, uh, we had a question from Zach in our under nines. He said, uh, what's your best rugby moment? Oh, um, well, I'd like to say my best rugby moment hasn't happened yet. So uh, I would say I'd, I'd rather think the best, the best is yet to come. So it might be this year that the Harlequins in the Premiership. It might be in five years' time that that we've now won three in a row. Uh, but but I always like to think the best is yet to come. Um, you know, if if that's a weak answer, then then so be it. I'll give you something slightly different. But that would be that would be my thinking: is what has happened has happened. I can't change the past. You know, the past has put me where I am today. All I can do now is influence the future. So the best is yet to come. Yeah, I, I like that. And let's face it, the past hasn't been that bad, right? You've won Grand Slams with England, Heineken Cups with with Leicester and Championships with uh, Saracen. So, you know, it's not that bad. Um, we've got a question from uh, Will Smith, who's in our under-16s. He said, what advice would you give to a teenage club player who's looking to reach their full potential? Oh, did that? Did that? Uh, don't, don't die! Don't die! Give a dollar, coming. I think you said for for. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. think you're saying like teenage teenage yeah, player so, looking to fulfil his potential. Yeah. The uh, yeah. What advice would you give to a teenage club player looking to reach their full potential? Excellent. Well, what what, what I would do is I would, I would for the, for the player and the parent I would I would embrace both. So the, the coach at the club or the coach at the school, I think it's important they probably, probably try and work around three kind of buckets, if you like, is... I, I do I do think challenge is, is important to, to, to make sure that the parents understand that if you keep telling your kid every time they play a sport or do something that they're the best or they did you know they were outstanding and amazing and then and they weren't then all you're doing is 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 putting false false um education in somebody and and I think it's important to understand that we want people to be resilient young men and women and if they become rugby players 
that's brilliant. But but the life goal is, is something slightly different. So to make sure that that you, you're challenging and supporting in equal measure, but but making sure that it's it's always measured. So for the parents and embrace from that. Now that goes one step further in terms of nutrition, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of doing extras, uh, identifying the extras that you want to do in conjunction with your coach. Um, what else can you do? What else? What else do you need to do? And, and the more for, for younger kids that really have a thirst to be a professional player is, is, to, is to take ownership as much as they can of certain things around it. And now it's hard when you're 15, 16 maybe to, to understand what that looks like, but ask the question with your coach, ask the question with somebody that might be able to help you, and then try and identify a pathway. So challenges is all around just making sure that things are balanced on, the, on, on your progression through to make sure that you're still being stimulated to grow and improve. Because again, just like our, the best is yet to come for me as a coach, you know, Owen Farrell still believes his best games around the corner, you know, and, and he's, he's, he's not done too bad, guys, let's be fair. Mm -hmm. um, so like he, and, and he's so driven. He's so driven with things and he, he embraces challenge. Uh, he looks for things. He has complete autonomy uh, and ownership about what he does. And, um, you know, he's, he's a great role model in that respect. Um, the, the next thing I think is, is like communicate. It, it, it's, it's vital, I think, again, and, and I said I put the parents with this as well. It's important that you know, communication um, to, to your kids, from the, from the coach to, to the player, the player to the coach, that whole triangle, you know, take the school in there as well, is that you have a fluidity about messaging and about what it is that you're trying to get out of it. And uh, maybe you've all got a common message. You know, so if, if a club coach is saying one thing and a school coach is saying the other thing, you know, and the parents sit in the middle and hearing one thing together, rather than trying to play them off against each other, try and see if you can embrace a situation where you can get some commonality of language so the that the player has more clarity. Yeah, because mm -hmm. with clarity, you get confidence. And, it, and it's hard to change everything all the time, right? So if you, if you can focus on two or three things, and that could be a, a strength that you want to make a super strength, or it could be an area that you want to progress or work on, if you can just identify two or three things and make a big growth in those areas, that would be way better for your game than just picking up a little bit everywhere here because you're just going to be, you know, if you were just average on everything, say, and I use average as a, as a poor word, but if you were six out of ten like here and you went to six and a half out of ten them all, the difference isn't significant. But if you keep it as a six out of ten on these things but go to an eight, an eight, and an eight, then suddenly you've made a big change to your game. So, so identify two or three things and, again, have, have, the, have the communication around that being, being constant and consistent but the final thing i would say again around it would be would be to be committed you know like like we said before to have a passion for the game to have a work ethic um all that kind of thing for those that are going to make rugby as a, as a career um you know you have to make some choices uh, and it's not necessarily 15 16 you have to do it but you at some stage you have to make a choice that you know as, as this window of opportunity gets smaller and smaller and smaller uh, the closer you get towards the, an academy contract for example there's only probably up to six, maybe six, six kids a year going to, into a pathway. And if you think of the amount of kids in, um, in, a, in an area, it could be like 20,000, 25,000 that playing rugby in, in Hertfordshire, uh, Middlesex or something like that, and Kent or something like that. I'm trying to think what, uh, what, what Sarri's uh, counties are. But in, in those kind of three areas there, it could be 20,000 kids, and that's come down to six people getting, a, getting an opportunity. Wow. So, you know, you want to be, if you really believe you've got it, and, you, and it's and you really want to strive for it, then you've got to show commitment and you've got to make some sacrifices and you've got to understand. And that's where the, the communication piece comes into it. How do you get to where you want to get to? It's great to be committed, but if you're, if you're thinking that I'm going to be committed because I'm spending an hour every night doing 50 yard right hand passes, but I play loose head prop, like it's not going to, it's not going to help you. But if you're going, well, what does commitment look like for me in my position? And it could actually be, well, how can I develop, you know, back strength or neck strength, or how do I develop um, uh, groin flexibility, or how do I develop uh, a better scrum position? And, and joining those dots, I think, is important. So, like, challenge, communicate, and uh, commitment, I think, are three, three things. The final thing, which is the most important thing, is to enjoy it, is to enjoy it. You know, like, like rugby's meant to be fun. Like, hitting people, tackling people, uh, hitting people in terms of a tackle, I'm saying here, moving bodies in terms of uh, rocks, running hard into contact, beating someone with a sidestep, scoring a try, winning a game with your mates. Like that is that is what rugby is about. You know, it, it's core fundamentals. And one, one of the things I always remember massively when I was a kid, uh, when I was 21 ish, probably, is um, listening to an interview from Martin Johnston and someone asked him. So, so Martin was a, 
was a bank manager uh, at the time. If you can imagine going to a bank and asking money from him, you'd get a shot, wouldn't you? But it'd be like looking like Lurch from the Adams family. And um, he's Adele's best mate as well, so I can say that. But, 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 for, um, but for John, they asked him, so like, what would you be if you weren't a professional rugby player? You know, I work for HSBC, whatever it was. He went, well, an amateur rugby player. I love the game. You know, and it, 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 was, it was so perfect because it's just, well, that's how it should be. You know, like you, you've got to love the game. That you, you want to be dedicated to the game because you love the game. And then, you know, if you then get the opportunity and, and you're going to have to earn, of course, if you get the opportunity then to be a professional player and get paid for doing it, then that's even, that's like a massive bonus. Yeah, bonus but, yeah. but if not, like really, really enjoy what you're doing. And like anything, you know, enjoy what you're doing, give it your very best that you can do. And around those three kind of central things will give you, the, I, I think, the best chance of having clarity of thought, clarity of process, making sure everyone that you care about and you love is, is, all, is all joined the process and everyone's got your interests at heart, then you give yourself the best chance. Cool. Couple of, I'm conscious of time. A couple of questions uh, just about coaching uh, at the end. One was from uh, Andy Underwood, who's one of our under-16s coaches. Uh, he said, uh, you were part of our little club for a while, up at the OGs. And you very kindly took uh, our under 15s uh, for a training session last last year, which they all love, by the way. So thanks again for that. Um, what advice would you give to our coaches as as we sort of progress through the age groups? I mean, yeah, we start right at the, at the lowest level, as you know, and then we're taking these kids up to uh, you know under 16s. So, yeah, what do we need to focus on as coaches? Okay, I think I think it's you know there's a, there's a lot of similarity there again you know I think one enjoy enjoy what you're doing you know I think it's it's I think for all, for all you guys that that give up your time to to go and coach is is, is tremendous you know like to, to to go and do it on a Sunday morning when you're feeling a bit dusty and you know the, the time that you give up is is tough right but you do it because you love the sport so you you're already you're already ahead of a lot of people that do things in life because. They feel a need to, or want. We do it because they open the bar at eleven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, fair enough. Uh, yeah. But I, th I think, I think, I think you know, when when you when you want to do something, you don't need to do something. That already gives you your starter. Then, then like self awareness is always a massive thing for coaches, isn't it? Or in, in any job, really. Like if you, if you're self aware about yourself, like what am I good at? What am I not good at? And then, then depending on your coaching resource per year group. So say you've got four coaches, and as you go a little bit higher up in terms of age group where specificity of position uh, becomes more important, then maybe you go, well, look, do you know what I'd actually really like to do? I'd really actually like to be an attack coach. I really want to think about attack at a deeper level than I've done before. So then, 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 then you go, right, okay, well, what, what, what is the attack I want to actually do? Like if you think about what attack you want to be, if you want to be a width-based thing, you want to split your forwards up, you want to be a Warren ball around the corner team, you know, you start thinking about what does that actually look like on the field? So the first thing I always go is what's, what's the end point? So the end point is I want a team to look like this. And then come back saying, well, what key principles are then important? Because once you've got the key principles, so let, let, let's say, let's say, I'll give you a defense example, be an easy one. So defense, in, in, in layman's terms for me, it was always about um, two, 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 two ways of thinking. The first one might be like Phil Larder, um, who was the, when I was in, in and out England, was, was the defence coach there. And uh, he won the World Cup in 2003 with England. His was like, don't let them score. Don't let them score, right? Okay, so that's one way of thinking. Other way of thinking is, I want the ball back. Now, both ultimately might lead to the next thing. So, I want the ball back means they can't score because I've got the ball. By not letting them score means you're probably going to get the ball back. But it's just the way that you frame it in your mind gives you something different. So not letting them score, for me, sounds more cohesive, integrated, passive. Get the ball back sounds more aggressive, more urgent. So I wanted urgent and aggressive. So straight away, by just talking this through you now, you can see the language that's coming to my mind, urgent and aggressive. So if I want to get the ball back, what do I then need? Well, I want to take away time and space. So then I'm going, well, how do I take away time and space from the opposition? Well, it's take away time and you sprint off the line. So that's why where everyone now talks about line speed. So I was going to sprint off the line. And then I've got to take away opportunities or space around them. I need everyone to do it at the same time. Okay, so how do I get everyone connected? Oh, we're going to watch the ball because there's only one ball and there's 15 players. So I then got my, my thing is take away time and space is a primary thing. Dictate attack and options by being connected and then, then suffocate them with, with our discipline. So that was kind of my three kind of things. My process then came down to sprinting. OK, 
came to spacing, came to stain square, smashing them, and then round again, round again. So, well, once I had that, I then got this. I then got my coaching, my, my coaching template, if you like, of these are four things I need to coach. How do I coach good spacing? How do I coach uh, sprinting repeatedly? How do I coach uh, frosty in the tackle? How do I coach urgency back to feet and back in the game? So those are the four things I try and look at when I'm coaching. There's, there's other things, but let's just say fundamentally those. Okay, so now I've got those four or five things. How do I coach it? And then you're going to work out what that looks like in a game and off you go. And that could be through uh, webinars, uh, speaking to people, bouncing around ideas as coaches. And, and, and the, game, the game itself is a great learning tool. So you'll see things all the time think, right, okay, well, that's what it looks like. And that's what I want to try and copy. How can I think around the problem and then construct a session either through games-based learning or drills? Yeah. And I think, I think once, once you go down that avenue, specificity helps you narrow the amount of stuff you have to learn, the amount of stuff you have to be really good at. And then you get, you know, if there's three or four of you, then you can, then, then you can vibe off each other, you know, and you're still going to contribute and share and all that kind of stuff. But I think, I think that that's a, that's a really good way for coaches to, to think about the game. Like think what is the outcome? What, what's yeah. the higher purpose? What's the why? You know, in life, we're always looking for the why. You know, I'm looking for why Ali married you. So I'm like going like, what's the why? And then once you've got the why, mate, you just scaffold it down, like yeah. like you would do any, anything else. Got it. That's great. That's great. Well, we'll we'll, we'll put some thought into that. And, and the other thing about training. So I um, you know, I steal ideas from from everywhere where I take the kids. I watch them playing tennis. I watch them playing golf. I watch them playing football. And uh, and I'm always stealing. Uh, drills and games um, which I then convert into our rugby training sessions where do you steal your stuff from <laughs> Look, I think, I think like, everyone steals stuff from somewhere I guess along the way like for, for, like I, I probably steal stuff now without even thinking I'm stealing it you know because I, I don't I don't look at something else from a like I, I go on courses and I do personal about my speech to the coaches um, the amount of actual video sharing of what people do training wise is very few and far between as a coach, when I was with England, I went to every single club. I went to different places around the world. So I got to see lots of different things. But the, the drill bit isn't the bit I need. The, the, the drill bit isn't what I need. It, it's, it's understanding what it is I'm trying to fix or what I'm trying to create. That's, that, that's, that's the art of coaching, like identifying the problem and then identifying the best solution, which would be the most efficient and give you maximal output. So it's, it's, it's always trying to drag those two things together there. Yeah. Um, and look, I, look at one thing I miss out on the coach thing. I think the, the younger you go, the most important thing is them to get their hands on the ball as many times. So yeah. the, 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 most, the most important thing is not to overcoach them when they're young. It's just try and get them, you know, not stand around as much, passing the ball as much as possible, you know, be vibey, be changing. The longer you do something, and I, and I like this is me saying this from, from a senior, coaching senior players, is the longer they do a drill or an exercise, the more bored they get. So if, if I would go professional players' attention span, if I go over four or five minutes in a drill, they're done. Yeah. Like they're done. Like four minutes would be tops. That they'd be done on one drill. They'd be done. Like they'd just be like, Danny K be looking at me and going, like, what am I doing this for? You know? So I'd, I, I, have, I have to keep adding another layer, moving on, putting a different skirt on it, dressing it up different, and then repackaging it. Um, but, but, but I kind of move more into... Um, I would say like games-based learning. So if you go back to that kind of thing I spoke about there around, um, you know, spacing, staying square and so on for defense. Is if I play a game and a game could be 15 v 15, 12 v 15, 11 v 13, 7 v 7, 5 v 5, full field, short field, 40 by 40, 70 long, 35 wide, whatever. You, you know, there's four or five things you can change in coaching really. So you've got time. You can either shorten time and increase time. So intensity varies or density varies. Um, you could do a skill at the end of an extended period of time, so you've got fatigue. So that's the next thing you can influence. You can you can put them under heavy duress, uh, um, uh, distance or space. You can vary space, as I said there, with the field, shortness field, or numbers. So those are the four things you can play around with. But what I'm looking for when I'm coaching, whatever thing I, I, I construct, I look for three key coaching aims. Um, so in, in one session, I might be saying, look, it's imperative to replace we defend square because they do a lot of show and goes. So when we're, we're training, say against a preparing for Gloucester and Cipriano wants to show and go, or he does the no look pass, is we want to make sure we defend the ball, defend the ball, defend the ball. So the session I do is I put them where I'm get, asking the attack to challenge us with that way of thinking. But defensively, if we don't do it, I'll create a consequence. 
So the only thing I'm really looking for, we're defending. I'm not looking for every single thing. I'm looking, are we staying square? And I'll, I'll create a drill or I'll create a game where the consequence or the construct of the, of the, of the exercise is to put that skill under the most pressure. Yeah. So whichever way you do it, it's just trying to identify again, what's the key things you want? How do you then come up with it? And you'll come up with some great ideas just because in your own mind now, you've got absolute clarity about what it is you're trying to coach rather than grabbing a drill, grabbing a drill because it looks nice, but you've got to understand what it is you're trying to get out of that drill. If not, it just becomes a bit of a mixed match and, and off you go. Whereas if you go, well, let's say, I want to try and get someone to be able to pass the ball left to right, um, 25 meters. Well, if you've got a 12 year old, you can't pass the ball 25 meters left to right, maybe. So you go, well, okay, what's, what's the first passage of that? Well, if I was building it up in a drill of some sort, it would just be one to one person passing five meters or seven meters. Then I'll get a bit wider. Then I'll have this person under a bit of pressure. Then I'll get the next person under pressure. Um, then I'll get them go, starting off the floor and going back to the feet. And it's the same thing you do. And it's still passing the ball seven meters, but you've gone from no pressure to pressure. You've gone from different starting position. You've gone from maybe tackling a pad back into it. And like one thing there that was a, a, a small skill exercise, you suddenly start moving up, then seven becomes 12 meters. Then you don't tell him you moved it to 15, or the person isn't there and he looks and he throws the ball going, where are you looking at? You know, you've got to pass the hands, all that kind of stuff. So whatever it is, you just suddenly come with an idea and you just be able to flow with it because you know what the end outcome is you're trying to get to, and then you got to work back, scaffold back. Yeah, 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 just building it backwards. All right, well, we're probably going to uh, wrap up in a second. Last couple of questions then, mate. So... Yeah. Uh, uh, scrum halves uh, have the reputation for being the most annoying and gobbiest players on the pitch. Uh, who was the most annoying scrum half you've ever come across? And what was it about Adele that made him like that? <laughs> oh, genius. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't That's know. If Kate, did Kate ask that one? Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah, so, laughs> yeah. The only thing I'd say about doing is, is he's got, he's like a bear. He grows another, like another body, body weight of hair within three hours. But the, the, the two gobbiest nines I reckon I've played with would have been Austin. Yeah. Like Austin, Austin, Austin's got one of those kind of faces that you don't mind resting your hands on. <laughs> you know, he's got kind of that kind of person. Um, but like, he's actually, he's, he's just one of these people that would rather be talked about in a bad way than nowhere. You know, like he just, War for Ducks back, uh, very successful now with business and life, uh, do, doing really well, you know. So he, he, he's definitely one. And Richard Wigglesworth would be the other one. Again, very cocky, very arrogant, uh, in, a, in a great way, driven. Like Wiggy's so driven, so dedicated. Uh, brilliant, brilliant rugby player. Very, very, you know, very, very skillful. I think he's got 30 odd caps, which people don't really appreciate because. Ben Young's and Danny Kerr have got 80 odd each, or no, actually Ben Young's got 99 now. But um, yeah, but like Wigglesworth, also very, very dominant with his voice, very talkative. And uh, Austin, obviously, as, as we all know, isn't called the, uh, the Leicester God for nothing. Yeah, yeah, what a character. And Adele actually asked a question. Uh, he said, In uh, June 2000, Barbarians beat the Tigers at Twickenham. You were playing for Leicester, I think. Um, I think the Barbarians had quite a big win, 85-10 or something like that. But, and he said, why was the score so one-sided? I can't remember. Like, I don't think the score was that big, by the way. It was, we got pumped, but it wasn't that big. So we'd been, we'd been away. So we just won the, um, we just won the Premiership. Uh, or the Highland Cup, I can't remember. We did, we did a double twice. and I, Whatever it was, I can't, I can't remember. And um, we went away on the Saturday for Martin Johnson's, Will Johnson's, and Pat Howard Stagg doing Benador. Oh, uh, that's where the old Ashmolians were out there because um, uh, we had to carry Will Greenwood back in from somewhere. There you go. So we went, we went over there on a stag do, right? <laughs> um, so that was on the Friday. We got back on the Tuesday. On Tuesday. We met up on the Friday. We got Tuesday Wednesday. I think the boys then got back in Leicester. We, we, just, we just won the league the week before something. So we went back on the drink again. And then we turned up for training on the Thursday. Thursday before, oh, Thursday, Thursday before, yeah, Thursday before, we play, like a gentle jog through half an hour. Like, I think Dean realised boys were in a bad shape, like a bad shape. And John was going to play, like John was John played and everything. So on the Friday we got the um, we got the train down to um, to London. Uh, I think we were the car, 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 train on, We did we did like the waterlogged embankment, and uh, we had a, we had a glass of wine and, and uh, a bit of a chill. Like, That's a bar bars. We'll, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, it's going to be tough, but we're good. Like we're on form. We're a great season. 
we did the warm up in the the old car park opposite um, opposite Twitter, sorry, what they call it now. Uh, but it's you, you can't go in there anymore. It's through the West Car Park. There's a field there, and we trained. We got back in the changing room, and honestly, it was like a brewery. The smell of alcohol <laughs> coming through everyone's body. And the worst thing is, we scored a try. Jono scored a try five minutes into the game, and the whole crowd's lifted up, going, "Oh, like you know, he's left on the roll." And I was looking at each other, going, "Oh my god, <laughs> we've got nothing more to give. <laughs> we've got nothing more to give." And that was it, mate. We'd had the heaviest of all heavy stag dues for three, four days, and then another day in Leicester, and uh, we're all st still drunk, mate, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, le le lessons learned there. Um, all right, well, look, that's, that's been brilliant, Paul. Um, look, thanks so much. Uh, well, uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, down at the OGs uh, when we can and, and buying you a beer. Um, and, uh, but thanks very much for, uh, for actually the support you've given the club previously. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to catching up with you again soon. It's been brilliant. Nice talking to you. Thanks, thanks guys. Much. Stay safe. Sorry, stay Cheers, alert. And, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Very Be safe. Sure. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Didn't winch more. <laughs> there we go, mate.